good afternoon everyone at the outset i would like to thank uh, rujuta kamal ma'am and all uh, vaika ma'am deshmukh sir and department of pathology for having us as a chairperson for such a prestigious cme and for, i would like to congratulate dr kamal ma'am for such a beautiful uh, book she has released today now we are ha having this uh topic of management of infertility in pcos you all know pcos is a endocrine disorders which most of the time lead to infertility and 5 to 10% of the patient leads to infertility and management varies a lot right from lifestyle uh, management to medical to uh, art you have to correlate with each best for the patient you have to start so we are going to have this topic with dr moshmi who is a very well academician and a very good associate professor and out of all she is a very good human being and a friend of mine uh, i will request moshmi to continue with her topic thank you shama ma'am for those kind a very good good morning and warm welcome to all of you Uh, uh this is a uh, i have a very immense sense of pride as the alumni of this institute of 92 batch and after 30 years sitting on that side and coming on this side so it is a sense of great Im immense pride for me standing here in front of all my teachers and stalwarts and speaking in front of you so at the outset i would like to thank all the organizers of this cme dr kamal madam dr gajbi sir dr vaikam madam rujita madam and entire pathology department for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic so the topic of my talk today is management of infertility in pcos though i am not an expert in infertility as a medical teachers we are as you all know we are jack of all trades so if uh, there are some nuances or uh, like uh, lacunas please uh, 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 sorry for that but still i would like to uh, talk on this topic of management of infertility and pcos so as we all know that pcos is a very complex uh, disorder Uh, involving the endocrinological system of a female and uh, it affects entire uh, pathology endocrinology sy system of the female which is this system this disorder is associated with persistent hyperandrogenic chronic and ovulation and it is associated with hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance which results in menstrual irregularity infertility and hirsutism so uh, around 8 to 13% of women suffer from this disorder 70% of them they remain undiagnosed and 50% of women with infertility they suffer from pcos so that is a large number so these women of pcos they suffer in different aspects Uh, the first is the reproductive aspect that is they suffer from infertility menstrual irregularity and the major uh, disorder or pathology in them lies in the metabolic syndrome insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and also they suffer from psychological disorder in the form of anxiety depression and body image because they suffer from obesity hirsutism and all these factors so these are the clinical manifestations of pcod uh, like uh, so we'll be mainly dealing with infertility i'll be dealing mainly with infertility while uh, the uh, clinical and hormonal i will be dealing the clinical factors with pcod while hormonal will be is, uh, taken up by the next speaker so PCOD has different phenotypes it is a spectrum of disorder few female males they suffer from certain things and the other they suffer from other uh, certain things and some of the females they suffer from all the disorders so there are various phenotypes in this 
So there are four major phenotypes. In A phenotype types, the females suffer from hyperandrogenism along with ovulatory dysfunction and polycystic ovarian morphology. In phenotype B, they suffer from hyperandrogenism and ovulatory dysfunction. In phenotype C, they suffer from hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovarian morphology. And D, that is the milder form, they suffer from ovulatory dysfunction and only polycystic morphology. So from A to B, A to D, the, uh, that is the grading system from major to minor degrees. So once some uh, word about a lean PCOS. When we talk about PCOS, a female that comes in, our, in front of our eyes is an obese female who is, who is having obesity, acanthosis, nigricans, hirsutism, acne. But there is one entity called as lean PCOS that is a little bit different from the obese PCO. So uh, these lean PCOS, they are less common and they suffer, but they also suffer from hormonal, metabolic and all the hematological profiles. It is altered in lean PCOS. And the derangements are comparable or less obvious as compared to obese women. But the treatment is same in both the females. So what is the exact cause of infertility in these PCO females? So uh, the exact etiopathology is not known, but it is linked with genetics that it runs in families. The, it and siblings, they suffer from PCOS. So the main pathology here is the post-receptor failure. And, the, and the, that is the insulin receptor failure. There is increased serine phosphorylation at the site of insulin receptor and decreased tyrosine acetophosphorylation of insulin receptor that leads to hyperinsulinemia. And some genetic factors that leads to hyperandrogenism. So the ovarian milieu, it becomes hyperandrogenic and it leads to chronic anovulation. I will not go into much details as my next speaker will be speaking on this. I will mostly talk about the clinical correlations. So WHO has classified the, uh, the types of anovulatory disorders and PCOS is, comes under the type 2 WHO classification. Type 1, there is no FSH, no LH, that hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. While in type 2, there is normal estrogen and FSH and LH levels. While type 3, there are no follicles, there, are, there is no estrogen, no FSH, LH. Then, what are the diagnostic criteria? There are the famous Rotterdam criteria by which we diagnose PCO, which involves the oligo and or an ovulation, hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovary on USG. There's an interplay of these three uh, symptoms. So any two of these symptoms, the pa patient will be labeled as PCO. Clinical, if there are two clinical uh, symptoms are present, oligoanovulation or hyperandrogenism, there is no need of uh, USG diagnosis. Now recently, guidelines have changed and the 2018 new guidelines have come up. These are the international evidence-based guidelines for assessment and management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, they were published by Center for Research Excellence in Polycystic Ovary Syndrome in partnership with SRA and ASR. So according to these guide, new guidelines, we have to uh, classify the PCOS. These are the investigation, these are hormonal evaluation which has to be done for a PCO patient. The serum LH FSH levels, serum androgen levels, that is serum testosterone and androstenedion, serum estrogen and prolactin levels. Out of these, serum testosterone and androstenedion are most important. According to the new guidelines, LH FSH ratio does not have that much of importance. Then the test for insulin resistance is very important because these females have great insulin resistance, obesity, so for that serum fasting insulin, fasting glucose, glucose insulin ratio and glucose tolerance tests, they are preferred. But according to the new guidelines, these in serum insulin levels and uh, has no, not much importance. More importance is given to clinical features. Then ob obviously, obesity, if they are obese, they have lipid abnormalities also. 
So according to the new guidelines, the uh, PCOD criteria for according to which we diagnose a PCO, there should be uh, more than 20 follicles per ovary. And that too, we are doing on a transvaginal ultrasound by a 8 megahertz probe. And the ovarian volume will should be more than 10 ml. So previously, they were used to say that eight or more subcapsule of follicles with, with less than 10 mm in diameter and increased ovarian stroma. These were 2008 guidelines. But these new regulations, according to new regulations, these are the number of follicles they should be present in the ovary. Now what workup should be done in a woman with PCO and infertility? So these are the routine investigations we advise women. There's a C husband semen analysis, tubal patency test, thyroid profile, now, a word about anti-mullerian hormone. That is very important in a patient of infertility. It is a glycoprotein that is secreted by the granulosa cells. And as there are multiple growing follicles in PCOs, so the serum AMH, AMH levels, they are raised in PCOs. It is a marker for the ovarian reserve and it correlates well with the antral follicle count. And, but many people are, they, it, uh, disusing or there may be wrong use of this uh, uh, AMH. So it should not be used as an alternative for detection of polycystic ovarian morphology or a single test for diagnosis. And normal serum uh, AMH levels, they range from 2 to 6.8 nanogram per ml. So before starting any treatment for infertility, we should rule out diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, hypothyroidism, hyperlipidemia, vitamin D deficiency, and they should be treated appropriately. This is an algorithm for management of PCOS. First line therapy is always the pharmacological treatment in the form of glomifin citrate and aromatase inhibitors. Second line is gonadotropins or laparoscopic ovarian drilling. And the third line is in vitro fertilization. These are the guidelines, but as and when we, they have to be changed according to the type of patient, age of the patient, the duration of infertility. So according to that, we have, we can change the first line, second line, and the third line of treatment. So first and the foremost is the lifestyle modification, change in the lifestyle. For, and uh, of this, first is the weight reduction. That has an immense effect on the treatment of infertility in PUS, PCOS. Loss of about even 5 to 10 percent of body weight will re restore the reproductive function. So less dose of tomifin and gonadotropins are required if the weight reduction is there. So the patient has to be advised proper diet, exercises, anti-opacity drugs is controversial. So main is that the weight should be reduced. Counseling is very important because these patients, they are very high responders to treatment and that may lead to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, multiple pregnancy, and they may require fetal reduction. So counseling is very important before starting any treatment. What are the modalities? There are the pharmacological and surgical modalities. So let's see what, how can we treat them. First is the citrate. Although letrozole, that is the aromatase inhibitor, has taken over clomiphen citrate, but still, chromophen citrate is a preferred drug of choice. It is a selective estrogen receptor modulate. It has a selective estrogen receptor modulating action. And it um, binds with the hypothalamic and pituitary estrogen receptors. And because of that, estrogen concentrations, they are falsely perceived as low, which leads to increased GnRH production and increased FHNLH. And this leads to multiple follicle formation. So here the uh, uh, chromophen will act. The starting dose is about 50 milligram per day for five days. And then each cycle, if you can increase by according to the response. It has a long high half life of five to seven days. So you can, you can start from the second day of the menstrual cycle up to fifth day for five days and start the monitoring the uh, ovarian follicles from 10th day of the cycle. Monitoring is very important in any kind of ovulation induction that I'll be talking in details later. 
So what are the results? 70 to 80 percent will show evidence of ovulation. 40 percent of these will conceive. 5 percent may have multiple pregnancy. And 20 to 25 percent will be clomiphene resistance. Complications are very rare with clomiphene. A few minor complications are there. OHSs can result, but it's very rare. So why there is so much discrepancy between ovulation and pregnancy? Because it has an anti-estrogenic action on the cervical mucus and endometrium. So there's, a, there's suppression of the endometrium and there are high LH levels. So that leads to less pregnancy rate. So we must know when we talking about clomiphene, we must know what is clomiphene resistance. When the patients for, fail to ovulate for three cycles, continuous, then it is called as clomiphene resistance with a maximum dose. And if the patient fails to conceive after giving three cycles, she is ovulating, but she is not conceiving after three cycles, then it's called as clomiphene citrate failure. So when such, such thing happens, we have to rule out other reproductive uh, dysfunctions and other causes of infertility. And this may also because of the anti-estrogenic effect of clomiphene citrate. So initially clomiphene citrate was very uh, indiscriminately used. So ICOG and ACOG have given recommendations that this should be used for a maximum of 12 months in a patient's lifetime and for a maximum six months continuously. Because the concerns were there, there is a possible linkage with later life with ovarian cancer has led to giving these recommendations. Then what are the adjuvants which can be used with clomiphens to improve the ovulation and pregnancy rates? Corticosteroids can be given if the, there are high levels of uh, DHEs, dexamethasone 0.5 milligram per day, sorry, 5 milligram per day. Estrogen may help in improving the estrogenic actions, but it, it is not recommended. Then bromocryptin is given if there is galactoria or if you see that the lactate levels are increase. Now a word about metformin. It's a very important drug and very much talked about and hyped. It is an insulin sensitizing agent. When PCOS studies were done and comparison of two drugs were done alone or in combination with clomiphene, clomiphene was found to be better than it was combined with metformin. So the only indication we can find now for metformin is it is, it is clomiphene resistant woman you can combine metformin or before proceeding to drilling or treatment with gonadotrophins or it may be added to uh, clomiphene in women with clomiphene resistance who are older and who have visceral obesity. So now we find indication of metformin in obese women. Also in type 2 diabetes and those who are going in for weight loss. Now in whom SCG is given? It is given in women who require IUF but in whom LS surge cannot be detected despite good follicle formation. Ovulation usually occurs after 34 to 46 hours after SCG. So IUI can be done after 36 hours. And in which woman LS surge can be detected, IUI can be done up 24 hours after the LH surge. Now the next drug is the aromatase inhibitors, that is the letrozole, and it has, to some extent, it has replaced clomiphene. So, uh, aromatase, it, it is an enzyme. Aromatase is an enzyme that converts androgens to estrogen. So, these aromatase inhibitors act on this enzymes and this creates a relative deficiency of estrogen. This results in increased FSH from pituitary and increased FSH levels. So, what are the indications? It is given in clomiphene resistant women who respond to clomiphene but do not conceive. The dose is 2.5 to 5 milligram per day. Advantages of uh, letrozole over clomiphene is that it has no receptor action. It has no effect on the endometrium and cervix. It has a short half-life and high level of aromatase P450 in endometrium suppre is suppressed. That causes good implantation. So the pregnancy rates, they are better. Multiple pregnancy uh, rates are less. No difference in congenital malformations and no wear in hyperstimulation is there why there is no risk of multiples in letrozole. Because it is a short half-life, it does not block the estrogen receptors 
and once it is stopped on the day 7 the dominant follicle grows and starts secreting the estrogen due to which there, there is decrease in FSH and only the dominant follicle will grow. So it leads to monofollicular development. There were few controversies with letrozole regarding congenital malformations but later on it was found that there was no difference in both the groups. So it is considered as safe nowadays. So what is the current evidence for letrozole? It is used as a primary agent for ovulation induction in PCOS. It's a beneficial endometrial receptivity, equal results in the patients who has undergone laparoscopic ovarian drilling and safety profile is good and it is and it is in compared to gonadotropins, it is there is low cost. Now, after these two drugs, the next therapy is gonadotropins. If the patient does not respond to these oral drugs, next is the hormonal preparation, that is the gonadotropins. So the, it is uh, given in patients who are CC resistance or they have failure. What is the type of gonadotropins that can be used? That is the HMG, that is human menopausal gonadotropins, highly purified urinary HMG and FSH, recombinant FSH. FSH is preferred or HMG in females with PCOS because there are high levels of already in PCOS and HMG has combination of both. So there are different protocols. So these are the different protocols for gonadotropins. I would not go much in details. But there are few protocols like fixed dose regimen, 75 to 150 international units started from day 2 to 3. This protocol is simple and it is followed with good results and outcome. So the, <clears throat> this is the low dose. Next row is the low dose step up regime. Started with low dose, that is 35, no, 37 to 50 international units. And then E2 and ULG are done on day 7. And if E2 level is more than 200 or follicle size is more than 10 mm, same dose is continued until desired follicle is reached. Then individually adjusted regimens guided by the ultrasound, folliculometry and serum E2 levels, the step up protocols and step down pro protocols. So what are the results with gonadotropins? Pregnancy rate it is in CC resistant women is 5 to 15 percent and the cumulative pregnancy rate is 30 to 60 percent. Multiples is 15 percent. Miscarriage rate is high to 20 to 25 percent and there are certain chances of OHSs. So gonadotropins can also be combined with CC. So these are the few protocols which can be combined. Combination and there are few advantages of this that uh, there is a reduction in the dose of gonadotropins and cost is also re reduced and uh, chromifin uh, citrate resistant and ovulatory women, they are very sensitive to low dose of gonadotropins. The, the next protocols are gonadotropins and uh, uh, GNRH agonist protocols. These are different protocols which are used by infertility specialists. So I will just go through it. And the next protocol is gonadotropins with antagonistic protocols. The results, they are very favorable and very good. Ovulation rate is about 50 to 80 percent and pregnancy rate is 80 percent after 6 to 12 months of treatment. Results, uh, advantages are that monofollicular development and no risk of multifetal pregnancy and OHSS with antagonistic protocols. Now we can add uh, dopamine agonist if there is galactoria and prolactin levels they are raised to improve the ovulation and pregnancy rate. These are the doses of bromocryptine. Now let's see, uh, talk about laparoscopic ovarian drilling. It is done in women with clomiphene resistance or failure or high levels of LH. Monopolar cautery is used for destruction of the ovarian stroma which causes destruction of the androgen producing tissue in the ovary and which results in increased FSH. 40 to 90 percent of women they conceive, ovulate and half of them conceive. But the risk are additions and decreased ovarian reserve. This should be reserved in women who are not willing to afford cost and risk of gonadotrophins. Then, then last chance and an option for IV, uh, PCO patients is the in vitro fertilization. It has high success rates 
with supernumerary embry embryos, which can be preserved for future. And this can modify the risk of multiples. The side effects are cons so that is expensive and may lead to hyperstimulation. So there's a word I would like to talk about monitoring, how these women should be monitored. Monitoring is must. Why monitoring is, should be done? It should be done to evaluate the dose, of, whether it's being used as optimal or not, to adjust the dose of your drugs, to find optimal timing of the ovulation in different drugs, timing of IUI, and to avoid, avoid ovarian hyperstimulation and multiple pregnancy. Patient is monitored by E2 levels, that is estradiol levels, USG alone, or by both, by color Doppler or by other hormones. Now, when a woman is uh, giving ovulation, being given the ovulation induction drugs, uh, day two transvaginal sonography is very important. It is done to see the enteral follicle, to rule out the cyst, to see for endometrial shedding or any pelvic pathology. On this day two scan, we expect normal ovaries with small follicles. And follicle monitoring is started from 7 to 8th day. We usually start from the 10th day. And in gonadotropin cycles, it is start even earlier. The follicles, they grow um, at the rate of 2 to 3 millimeters per day. When the follicle reaches 18 to 20 mm, it is a mature follicle. It correlates well with the serum estradiol levels. And, but now USG monitoring has replaced the estradiol levels. Now, follicle Doppler studies, they are very important. So when, when uh, we many times see that the good follicle is developing, but it is not being converted into pregnancy. So there is less blood supply and that results in lesser pregnancy rate. So mature follicles should show at least three-fourths uh, at its size should show vascularity. PSV should be that the peak systolic velocity of this droplet should be 10 centimeter per second. At this time, LS search starts and this time is to give the SCG trigger. So rising PSV and steady or low RI suggests follicle is close to rupture. If the PSP is decreasing and RI is rising, that suggests the follicle is likely to become the unruptured luteinized follicle. And if fertilization occurs at PSP of less than 10, it suggests that an embryo is with an chromosomal abnormality. So this is the perifollicular vascularization grading. So it is a grade 3 and grade 4 is a good follicle. So SCG trigger is given when follicle size is 18 to 20 millimeters in gonadotrophins and 20 to 22 millimeters in clomiphene cycles. Ovulation is confirmed when there is disappearance of follicle or presence of free fluid and smooth hyperechogenic endometrium. IUI is done 36 after SCG. Now there are um, uh, LH kits available in the markets that can be used to detect the LS surge. In some females, premature LS surge occurs in 25% of females and it can occur at a follicle of 16 mm. So urinary LH kits are available which can detect the LS surge and if you detect this LS surge, SAG is given at night, that time and IUI can be done 24 hours after that. So what are the chances of conception in IUI cycles? 50% of women below 40 years conceive within 6 cycles of IUI. Who do not conceive within 6 cycles of IUI, half will do so in next 6 cycles. Cumulative pregnancy rate is 75%. No word about ionocytose and PCOS. There are two types. These are the newer drugs which have come up and studies have been done and evidences have been collected on ionocytols and PCOS, myo and de chiro ionocytols. Now what is the role of these two ionocytols? These ionocytols, they are incorporated into cell membranes as phosphatidyl myo ionocytol, which is a precursor of ionocytol triphosphate. And this acts as a message, second messenger for hormones including insulin and FSH. So defects in this pathway leads to impaired insulin signaling and cause insulin resistance. So these two ionocytols can reduce insulin resistance, improve ovarian function and reduce androgen levels. They can be given as monotherapy or in combination with other treatment modalities. While myonocytols is necessary for metabolic management, 
Why? And uh, D-chero myonositol is important for menstrual, ovulatory, and cutaneous hyperandrogenic symptoms. So both myonositols they are important. Dose is four gram per day, two gram twice a day. Three months prior to ovarian stimulation is effective in normalizing ovarian function, improving oocyte and embryo quality, and it is given in the ratio of 40 to 1. So, what are the take-home messages? When we talk about PCOS and infertility, before starting any treatment, counseling is very important regarding weight management and the future risk if she conceives. So that is very important. First line is obviously medical therapy in the form of clomiphen and letrozole. Second line, gonadotrophins. Third line is IVF. And in all the things, monitoring is very important because there are risk of ovarian hyperstimulation and multiples. And obviously, a multidisciplinary approach is necessary. We have to include a dietitian and endocrinologist. Obviously, obstetrician is there, a radiologist sometimes is also involved. So thank you for patient hearing. Thank you very much. I can see that uh, a very infertility specialist and a stalwart, and I'm talking in front of him. Dr. Shea Baker is sitting here. So I would like that you will give insights, what more insights on this topic. So thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive lecture. The endocrinologist role stops when the patient says that they want infertility treatment. They want treatment for infertility. PCOS for endocrinologist is a cosmetic problem. This is a patient for hyperandrogenism in form of acne and hirsutism. We have a ferryman Galway score of hirsutism. The maximum score is 36. Significant is considered after 8. Uh, as you said, uh, we would like to have metabolic parameters checked would like to do glucose tolerance test and parallel insulin levels. You are given one figure of insulin resistance. Others is simple to do glucose tolerance test, find out fasting insulin, find out post two hours glucose and insulin. If it is more than 200, yes, sir. practically patient has got insulin resistance. Yes. In fact, if you examine patient clinically, you have acanthosis nigricans in the neck, axilla and groin. That indicates biochemical marker of hyperinsulinism and that patient is most suitable for metformin. You have to talk about metformin, start with 500 to 1 gram in each patient of these patients. This will, in addition to your convince that it might help in ovulation. If the PCOS patient is long-standing and hyperandrogenism uh, is present for a long time, it's better to give 3 to 6 cycles of OC pills to set the milieu interior normal and then consider for ovulation induction. Metformin can be continued during pregnancy. Uh, as you said, bromogocryptin and cabergoline can also be given. The dose of dexamethasone is small. It is like 0.25 to 0.5 milligram. We do 17 hydroxy progesterone as a marker for late onset CH. If it is more, then that should definitely be given. But uh, adding uh, steroid as an option, distant option, Adding uh, uh, bromogocryptin is also a distant option. One word about prolactin. We should do prolactin in a fasting state. It's a stress hormone. We should do it after 6th or 7th day of cycle when the patient uh, has finished her uh, menstrual cycles. Ideally, one has to take three samples every 20 minutes and take a pool sample. And if the prolactin is high, one also likes to do uh, prolactin in dilution. Giving bromogiptin if the prolactin is more than 50 might help. But before that, you must rule out hypothyroidism as a cause of hyperprolactin. Proton pump inhibitors and domperidon, hypothyroidism, mildly raised creatinine are more common causes of hyperprolactinemia than microadenoma and macroadenoma. Yes, sir. There are many patients of microadenoma who simply be treated with bromocuptin will give fertility. As I said, after the fertility, after the patient has solved his problems of look, acne, hyperandrogenism, and regular cycles, it is in pathologist and gynecologist domain to treat this problem. Long termly, these patients are prone for diabetes, hypertension, and as you said, lifestyle modification will be helping here. 
I think that must be enough from our side. Thank you, sir. You have answer. covered everything very Thank nicely, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request our chairpersons, Dr. Soni Lambulkar, sir, and Dr. Shama Kedar, ma'am, to felicitate Dr. Mosmi Tadas, ma'am, with a token of appreciation. <laughs>